welcome to Cashflow Savannah. We have a very special treat for you today. We have started to record our local meetups. We do meet once a month. It is called the Cashflow Savannah Meetup. And this event was epic. We had two wonderful speakers, Jabbar and Marcel. They're local boys. They're very successful. Um, you'll also see myself and my partner in the meetup. Her name is Suzanne Lee. She's a local wholesaler. She's excellent. Episode two, if you're interested in learning more about Suzanne, Marcel and Jabbar brought some really great content. So I hope you'll enjoy this live recording. Please also be aware that this is your official invitate to invitation to join us in the Cashflow Savannah Meetup. If you're local, um, please come by. We do meet once a month. We have a newsletter list. We have a Facebook page. If you follow Sid was here or Keegley Savannah on social media, you'll definitely know that it's happening please come down. Networking is crucial in this business. And you'll see that um, through these guys' stories, how much networking and working together really brought them quite a bit of wealth. So without further ado, welcome to Cashflow Savannah. Please enjoy our recorded version of our live local meetup. <laughs> so guys, we're going to start out our program. And every month when we meet, if you haven't been here before, we're all either current investors or we're future real estate investors. So we want to know a win and a want from anyone that wants to share. You can share one, you can share both. It's totally up to you, but it's, this would obviously all be real estate invested. So if you want a Ferrari, you can save that for your next group. But real estate wise, does anyone have a win? I have a win. I don't see my guy though. Is Aiden here? Has anyone seen Aiden Wigpole? He's not the one. Okay. I've got to get, listen, when Aiden comes in, I'll give him a shout out. I am an agent and Aiden Wigfall is the man. I had a property for sale and someone said, I'll buy it if I get the one next door. And I was like, I hate skip tracing. Blah. I had a real hissy fit in my head. And then I was like, wait, you know who's really good at skip tracing? Aiden. And I called him. I said, Aiden, can you get me the owner of this property? I said, if you can get him to sign with me as his selling agent, I'll give, there's Aiden right there. I'm talking about you. <laughs> Aiden, that's the man. I called Aiden, I said, Aiden, give me this guy to sign and I'll give you blah, 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 at closing. And within 24 hours, I had an adjacent owner selling his property along with Ooh. the one next door. Aiden, Ooh. Aiden Ooh. is awesome. So if you, ever need, if you ever need to hunt down an owner, call Aiden. I promise you for a fee, he will do that for you. And that is a huge service. So that is my win is Aiden Wigfall. Anybody else have a win or a need? Please. Come on, John. Hey, my name is John. Um, my win is very small. Um, I laid my first uh, self-leveling compound. Ooh, wow. It was terrible, but I did it, and I'm happy I did it. Good. So, <laughs> John, how much money did you save doing it yourself? Like $6. $6? <laughs> $6 to win. Very good. Anybody else have a win? Come on, I know people have been buying property in here. <laughs> Emily, Brian, come on, Brian. Um, I just got my first uh, deal on the contract. Yes. 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 Yeah, it's really hard to hear. Yeah, it's Hi, hard everybody. to hear in the back. Can you hear me in the back? A little bit. So this one for me is a win. So I've been in the business for eight months. I'm a rookie still, I'm new. Um, in the whole setting. And I've been trying to get my first lead for eight months. And I have four. Woo! Thank you. So I've been talking to the seller. It's one seller for so one lead. And every time I call him, with an offer, I have to think about it. So the next day I'm calling him, hey, Mr. Seller, you thought about it? Not, not yet. So I've been calling him for the last four days, maybe five days, and every time I'm calling him, you have to think about it. But I'm gonna keep trying, and I'm gonna update you in the next meeting. <laughs> I wanna say, Ivelisse is here every single month. She's been learning, she's been networking. And that's the name of the game. If you're here, please keep coming back. Like, we're all going to help each other get this. Anybody else? Come on. I know there's some more wins. Marcel, 
I know you have like 12 wins. Come on, Marcel. Uh, I got two more contracts today. Yes. Anybody have a need? Who wants a deal? Anybody looking for something specific? Uh oh. Many ones. Give me anything anywhere, and if it makes sense economical, we'll look at it. If you have a deal, call Kevin. You might get some money in your pocket. <laughs> Anybody else? What are you looking for? Who's? If you may say something you're looking for, some other guy across the way might have it. Anybody looking for something Any specific? Any properties at all? I'm buying. So feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm going to talk about my phone number and my speech and all that stuff. So we'll get into all that. We're looking for a duplex or a quadplex to hold on to. Okay. What side of town? We don't care. Okay. We'll, we'll buy anywhere in Under 400. Under 400. Under 400. Okay. That's the hard part right now. You don't want it fully re renovated. It doesn't matter to me. We, fully can, fix it. we can fix it. But I'm looking about a million. <laughs> Do we have anyone here that might have services, like building services and thing, and they're looking for clients? Any uh, contractors here? Any? Yeah, you can get really rich if you raise your hand right now. So. <laughs> Sometimes we do have those guys show up and they'll be like, I'm looking for work, and we're like... <laughs> Very good. I, if anyone is... Um, I want to point out our... Are you good at I'm decent. He's an engineer, so... <laughs> Very good. We have a wonderful sponsor I want to point out, Bridge Capital. They're a private money lender slash hard money. But I've also been working with another local lender. So if anyone's looking for great DSCR loans, let me know. I have a great lender for you. So they're not a sponsor, so I'm not going to put it up publicly. But if you ask me, I'll tell you because I love this guy. So we are waiting on our other speaker. <laughs> Should we get started with Marcel first? Uh, no? Yes. OK. okay. We, can we need more wins and more. I thought Jabbar yeah. was going to be here any second. Yeah, we can grab more drinks, okay. food. Uh... Please feel free to socialize. <laughs> Fox is ready. So as soon as uh, Mar Jabbar gets here, we will call you guys back to order. But thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. And please network, and we'll get started here very shortly. <laughs> Adesada. Adesada. <laughs> These guys are best friends, and they don't tear each other down. They build each other up, and I really love that about both of them. So we're going to have them present tonight, and just please give them a very warm welcome to Cashflow Savannah. How we doing, beautiful people? Yeah. Oh, wait, no, no, no. Let's turn up the energy. How we doing? Yes, Let's talk about money, financial freedom, you know, yeah. wealth. Yes, Let's sir. go. Let's get it. Let's get it. <laughs> so the first thing that we want to start off with is financial freedom, right? Why does everyone do real estate, right? We all want to be financially free. Raise your hand if you want to be financially free. All right. Okay, cool. So let's get into it. So Jabbar, talk about your first deal, how you kind of got into everything, and what led you towards the financial freedom route. All right, so before I go on to how I started, let me tell you about where I am and who I am. So I'm Jabbar Adesada. I'm a 21-year-old United States Marine. Where's my military in the house? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so I'm in the military, Marine Corps, like I said. Um, I own 21 doors that I keep, and then we have, like, what, 12, 15, 17 projects going on right now between like flips and hotels and properties that we're keeping as well. We primarily do short-term rentals. I've been in the game for about two and a half years and real estate has blessed me with a lot of opportunities, including being a millionaire in my 20s, Woo! being financially free, and also being able to give back and help other Marines who are in this room uh, become financially free through real estate investing. So to start at from the beginning, from the way back, I got started um, in Pooler, Georgia, I did what's called house hacking. How many people in here have house hacked? Yeah, nice. it's a beautiful nice. way, you know. So I, I got into real estate basically by buying a property with my VA loan. 
I bought a single family home, five bedroom, four bathroom. I lived on the futon and then I rented out all the additional bedrooms. So what happened to me in that moment is suddenly I was making more money from this one single property than I was making as a Marine, like working you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. So that kind of gave me the, blood, the, the bug and now I have a house buying addiction with my good friend Marcel here. So yes, that's, how, that's how it started. Yeah. Okay, so for myself, my name is Marcel Sunday. I own eight units right now. Like you said, we've got like 15 or 16 projects going on right now. A few that we're keeping, some that we're hoteling, some that we're flipping. And how I got started was, I started as a real estate agent, right? So a lot of people when they're getting into real estate investing, they think, oh, I need to go get my real estate license. That's not true. You don't need to go get your real estate license. But I got my real estate license at 18, right? I got my real estate license at 18, and I started cold calling, cold calling every single day. And I asked your about I would call him every single day, like, dude, this shit sucks. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, dude, you gotta just keep going, keep going, keep going. So I would cold call, cold call. I got a few deals as an agent originally when I was 18. Um, I had some listings. I did uh, some buyer deals as well up in Maryland. Um, and then when I was around 19, I decided to move to Myrtle Beach. Uh, actually, I skipped a part. I was an acquisitions manager for a wholesaling company, right? And what that allowed me to do was become really good at talking to sellers. The thing is, everything starts off with a deal. And if you don't have the deal, you don't have anything, right? So I wanted to go ahead and be an acquisitions manager because I wanted to understand how the deal works, right? Not only how the deal works, but how to get the deal, how to understand seller situations, how to understand how to help them and solve their problems. So I was an acquisitions manager for a little bit. I was an acquisitions manager for about seven months in Ohio. Decided to move from Maryland to Ohio to work with a huge acquisitions company who was doing about 25 deals a month. And I was able to learn from some of the best. I don't know if you guys went to the re-up event, but Jerry Green, superstar. Worked for him for a while. I was able to learn a lot about speaking to sellers, about the acquisition process, and the sales process as a whole. Then I was like, all right, you know, I don't need this anymore. I'm going to go figure this out on myself, by myself, right? Terrible idea. So, <laughs> so I left, and the money that I had saved up, I decided to put into marketing, right? Because I didn't understand how marketing worked. I understood how the acquisition process worked, but I didn't understand how marketing worked. So I decided to spend a bunch of my money on marketing. I did I spent money on VAs, I spent money on PPC, I spent money on a whole bunch of different things that I didn't really understand just yet. All of his money. All of my money, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and because I've always been the type of person where it's like, why not go all in, right? You know, we're young, we've got time, like, let's just do it, right? And so I spent all of my money trying to figure it out, figure it out. And I ended up having to go back home. So I went back home, lived with my mom for a little bit. I was doing the same thing. I didn't stop. And that's the thing, right? I want all of you guys to understand. You just can't stop. Because if you don't, the same thing. My mom was like, what are you doing? Just go to college. Where's my young folks at whose parents are like, oh, go to college. Where are we at? There's a bunch of them here. Right. <laughs> and so I was like, mom, like, there's no way I'm going to college. Like, I'm going to figure this out, right? And so she was like, I really think you should do the real estate thing while you're going to college. Not the worst idea, but for me, I was like, nah, it's not happening, it's not happening. He had a stint when he wanted to join the military, and I kept telling him no. Oh my god, yeah, so <laughs> I was gonna join the military, because I was like, you know what, Jabbar just got his first house hack. The military sounds like a pretty good option, you know, I want to do the real estate thing, I want to start trying to achieve financial freedom, and cold calling fucking sucks, right? <laughs> so, so I was like... <laughs> So I was like, all right, you know what? The military is going to pay me a little bit. I get to access the VA loan like my best friend Jabbar did. And um, he was like, dude, this shit sucks too. <laughs> wait, wait, Marcel. Before, I think some people don't know what cold calling is. And I don't think I explained house hacking. Got so it. before we go any further, can you explain cold calling? For and sure. then can you explain house hacking? Let's do it. So cold calling, right? This is when you are getting on the phone. You are randomly calling a person who owns a home. Right, you're calling them and you're saying, hey, I just saw your house on 123 Main Street. I was just wanting to check in to see if you're interested in selling. Right, and most people, you guys have houses here and different things like that. You're gonna tell that person to F off, right? <laughs> Unless you're actually looking to sell. So my goal was to get people who would raise their hand and say, yes, I'm actually interested in selling. Cool. 
And you want me to take over house hacking? Yeah. All right, so house hacking, for those of you who don't know, is typically you're using owner-occupied financing to buy a one to four unit home. So that's a single family home, a duplex, a triplex, or a quadplex. So the benefits of house hacking is you get to get into your first property, and you get to control a multi-thousand dollar asset with very little money down. So for my VA loan, my veterans, my military, that is me, you get into control one to four units for zero dollars down. For my FHA loan people, that's you, that's basically everyone else who has a W-2 or two years of um, verifiable income, you're able to get into a property with 3.5% down, right. and then there's also USDA loans, and they all have their different quirks and their different rules um, that can be beneficial to you, but it's basically leveraging those type of loans. You live in it typically for a year, and then you rent out the additional spaces in that property. So that's how kind of I've gotten a lot of um, of a head start, and that's how I was buying properties while Marcel was cold calling and doing that stuff, and I was slaving away in the military, is I was able to buy, I believe, like seven units, yeah. just with VA loans, uh, conventional loans, FHA loans, and things like that. Um, before I started buying properties with other people's money, which we'll talk about, and burring, and things like that, of that nature, and sub twos. Yeah. So, kind of back to where I was at. So I decided to leave. I was like, I'm too comfortable at home. So a lot of people, when they first start their entrepreneurship journey, especially if you're in your hometown, my first advice is fucking leave, right? The reason why you should leave is because you're very, very comfortable, right? You've got your friend next door, you got you know that girl that you used to like in high school or whatever it may be, and you wanna always hang out. And that's exactly what I was doing. I was spending five, six hours a day cold calling, but then I was hanging out with my friends. And I needed to spend all my time focusing on my goals. So I decided to move. I decided to move to Myrtle Beach. So when I moved to Myrtle Beach, this was around the time where Jabbar was like, don't join the military. <laughs> he was like, the military was a good idea for him, but he was like, where you're at, you need to just keep going because you're going to see success. You just need to focus on making money. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what I did. I focused on making money. So in Myrtle Beach, I was able to start getting a few deals. I was starting to get that consistency wholesaling real estate. Do we know what wholesaling real estate is? Some of them don't. Some of them don't. Okay. So wholesaling real estate is when you get a seller under contract, and then you are selling your rights to purchase this property to a real buyer or a flipper or a buy and hold investor. And you get a fee, and that fee is called an assignment fee. So that's what I was doing. I was wholesaling properties because at the time I didn't have the money, which I thought was important at the time to yep. buy the houses myself. So I was wholesaling. I started to create that consistency in Myrtle Beach and start wholesaling let's say one or two deals every single month. And then I gave Jabbar a call and I was like, because we would talk every single day. And I was telling him, I was like, hey, I'm getting some success wholesaling, but I'm dumping all my money back into marketing again, right? And if you guys try to scale quickly, you'll realize that you're going to end up spending money on marketing. But there's ways to do it free and we'll get into all of that as well. And so Jabbar was like, hey, why don't you come to Savannah? The craziest, I literally came to Savannah one year ago. So within one year, I was able to build my portfolio and I now have eight units, five of which being Airbnbs and short-term rentals. So I just want to you know, thank Jabbar for telling me, hey, come to Savannah in the first place because so, otherwise I would have decided to stay in Myrtle Beach. So that's kind of the backstory of, with me. And so before it seems like Marcel just helped me and I selfishly just asked him to come to Savannah, um, one of the biggest things with Marcel is we, he was looking for deals. So he was a deal finder. I was someone, I figured out raising private capital, I figured out how to analyze the deals, and I knew the basic fundamentals of real estate. But what I lacked was time. And so one thing that I've learned in this business, in business in general, is it's a giant game of leverage. You're taking weaknesses that you have, and you're finding someone else or something else, or it, may, it could be money, right? to basically supplement those resources so that you could be successful. So it was very tactful, it was a tactful or tac tactical, tactical play of me taking someone who's always looking for deals and then me always having access to capital for being someone who people like, know, and trust and combining forces to where we are today. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, and, and he's the reason why I'm a millionaire. Just like, so I thank you, man, because yeah. without you, I definitely wouldn't be here so quickly. And so, 
there's a bunch of things that we can spin off and we can talk about. But first, I want to get into some questions. Do you all have any questions from where we, where we are right now so far? Explain subject two purchases to people who don't know. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, so now you explain. You're so, the one who taught me. Yeah, so subject <laughs> two, right, is basically the seller currently has a mortgage in place, and you are taking over the mortgage subject to the existing mortgage in place. So let's say the seller has a 3% interest rate. They're paying $1,000 a month, and they're paying this to the bank. You are taking their place, and now you are taking over the payments for them. Do you guys, you all get that? Yeah. At the same time, explain what the interest rates climbing the way they are, how that's so important for a buying strategy. Yeah. We can give, we can we, give we my can, example. Need yeah. to, people need to understand we this. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. to make things affordable, to get into it, yeah. it makes it work for them. Yeah. So, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit. So, everybody is looking at the real estate market and we're like, oh, we got seven and a half percent interest rates. I'm just gonna wait until the interest rates come down before I start buying. But the reality is you don't need to do that. And Jabbar has a perfect example of a situation where a seller needed help. He was able to come in and buy the property subject to, and at the time, interest rates were about five and a half or six percent, and he was able to get into a 2.5 percent interest rate. Yeah, so pretty much the breakdown, and what I love that you emphasize is, yeah, interest rates are climbing up. Like, I think right now I'm looking to refinance one of my properties, and unfortunately, I'm looking at 8%, which is going to more than double my mortgage payment. So what the benefit of Subject 2 is, is it's offering me not only the opportunity to buy additional properties at a much lower interest rate, what I'm also able to do is you're able to get creative on how much money you're bringing down into the table. So for my specific example, I'll tell you guys, and hopefully, Marcel, you can chime in where you yeah. can see the different points to bring forth points. But I saw an opportunity where a lot of people in the military, and it doesn't have to just be military, it could be foreclosures, they're, they're really big into not having a lot of equity on their home sometimes. But specifically, people in the military, they're constantly moving to additional, real, to different uh, military assignments. PCS. Every three years, we have what's called a uh, PCS. Uh, permanent change station. station. Thank you. I should know this, right? <laughs> and so with that, I saw opportunity after opportunity of people buying a house for 300000 and then leaving maybe a year later, right? Because they don't, maybe they bought a house the second year of their three-year tour in Savannah or Beaufort, for example, and then they would leave and their house is still worth 300000 and sometimes these people, they don't know that they're able to rent it out or they don't want to deal with renting it out. So what I was able to do is I was able to start building rapport and building likeness with a lot of military members by telling them who I am, what I do, and what I specialize in. And then I finally found a seller with a distressed situation. I'll tell you about it. So this distressed seller, he was a Marine who had, um, he was basically, he had an early exit from the Marine Corps for personal reasons, and that caused him to move halfway across the country at like 20 years old. He didn't want to manage a property from halfway across the country, and then on top of that, he was also having a baby. And then he, the tenants that he had, he bought a duplex, so he was doing that house hacking thing we were talking about. He had a duplex, three bedroom, one bath, and a two bedroom, one bath, and his tenants weren't paying rent. So he had a failing Airbnb on one side, and then he had a uh, tenant that just was taking him through the ringer and he didn't know what to do. So what I did was because I built a relationship, and this is something that's important, a lot of people love to talk about like the how-tos, but really, this is something I recommend to all of you guys. Tell people what you're doing. Tell people what you're looking to do. Tell people who you are. Before I was a real estate investor, I was always telling people I was a real estate investor, that I'm looking to buy properties, so I was looking to invest, because that gives you that credibility and also that trust that uh, you'll need in the long run when you come across the opportunity where someone needs that subject matter expert to help them out. So basically, uh, with the tenant not paying rent and with, the, um, and with the property just not being a good property for him and him moving halfway across the country, I basically was able to buy this property from him subject to the existing mortgage. So I took over his mortgage, right? And with sub twos, one thing I want to hit on is the mortgage stays in their name. Yeah. So the, the liability of the mortgage is still on their credit report. It's still something that they're responsible for. So if you default, 
that affects them. Now there's things that you can do like personal guarantees and different types of ways you can structure to protect them, but that's a risk to them that you definitely want to bring out. Yeah. So what I did was I bought the property and because of all the, the challenges with it and because he just wanted to be out of it, I was able to buy the property and negotiate no money down. So essentially, because he didn't have any equity I, at the time. I don't think y'all heard him. He bought a property with zero dollars out of his pocket. It wasn't a VA loan. It wasn't a FHA loan. It was a property I literally, I, I paid closing costs. It was yeah. like two and a half grand. So it was a property that I purchased zero money down. I took over his $1,200 a month, two and a half percent interest rate mortgage on this, what, I paid 280 for it. It's, it's, worth, it's worth more now. Yeah. Um, and then basically, uh, I think on a long-term rental basis, I'd probably get, for the three one, let's say 2200 And then for the two one, I'd probably get, I don't know, 18, 1800 But because I am, I, if any of you have seen me on Instagram, I'm a very greedy individual. So I do Airbnbs, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, where's my Airbnb is at? Come on! <laughs> so I bought. I basically turned both units into Airbnbs, and just the two one alone rents for about three thousand dollars. That's like after the cleaning fees. So it's basically an asset that I got to control with a few thousand dollars, um, nothing on my personal credit report, and that's pretty much like an example of subject to. That's an example of also of what situations you should look out for to purchase your own subject to deal. And um, yeah, that's, that's the play, man. Yeah, and to get into that a little bit more, think about that cash on cash return, right? He bought a property, he paid closing costs. That's $2,500. I think he put like five or seven grand into renovating the property, rented it out, and he was doing $3,000 for one unit per month. That's an insane cash on cash return. And so that just emphasizes how much you should pay attention to not only distressed houses, but sellers who are in distressed situations. People always think, oh, the house needs to look like crap for me to buy it. Um, the nicest houses, you'd be surprised. Some people are going through divorce. Some people are going through other situations where they're just looking to get out and they're looking to get out quickly. And you guys can be the solution providers to these people and bring them exactly what they need and go ahead and purchase that property. You have a question? Hi. You want... um, I did. You mentioned earlier, Marcel, that you spent a lot on marketing. Yeah. What, if anything, would you advise other people to think about when they're going to spend money on marketing? I would tell you to not spend money on marketing. I would tell you for the, <laughs> for the first six months, right, do all of the free sources. And then I can get into some of the free sources for you guys. Agents, right? Agents, they make money when they sell you a house. So reach out to agents and ask them, hey, this is exactly what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a two-unit property, and I want it to cash only $500 a month. And I'm, I want it to be in, you know, let's say Thomas Square. And have them go out and look for that property for you. That's a free source. For me, I was doing a whole bunch of different types of marketing, and the paid marketing is something that you should do after you make money. After you make some money, that's when I recommend you go into some paid marketing. Yeah. Another way to get free leads is literally look up for sale by owner, Chatham County, right? When you do that, you'll literally find sellers who are trying to sell their house. They already raised their hand because they posted their property saying, hey, I'm looking to sell my house. So that's another way that you can get free leads. Um, what else do we got? Wholesalers, right? Reach out to wholesalers, because wholesalers, again, they're deal finders. They're people who are looking for deals, but expect to pay them an assignment fee. So reach out to wholesalers, let them know, hey, this is my buy box. This is exactly what I'm looking for. Please send me whatever you get when you get this thing that I'm looking for. And expect to pay them. How I buy the craziest deals is I go to stuff like this. Literally. There's people all around you, like, Man, we probably have something that will sell you, you know? Yeah. But there's people all around you investing, buying properties that have deals that you would buy. So what might not be a good opportunity for me or for Marcel might be a good opportunity for you. And I've bought millions of dollars of real estate from people in this room. And I've done deals with multiple people in this room. So I definitely recommend leveraging relationships by just being a good person, being someone who's trustworthy, doing what you say you're going to do. And then you can do a lot of good business just in these rooms right here. That's right.
There's multiple agents. I want to call a few out just in case you guys are looking for deals. We got Nicole Moore right over here. We got Jane right over here as well. So if you guys are looking for deals, Julie, right? Julie, 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 right here too. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, hey, see? Hey, look, 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 look. You guys have tons of people here at your, I want to say disposal, that sounds horrible, but you have tons of people that you can build relationships with, yeah. right? Treat them well, of and course. they'll treat you well. Exactly. Be a serious buyer, and they'll treat you as a serious client. Exactly. Anybody have any questions for us? I have a question. Suave. For the seller that originally was doing subject to, if they're still on the mortgage, which you said, right? Mm -hmm. How does the escrows are still required? You're paying. Right? Yeah. Sorry? The escrows are still required unless. Are you. So, your question was how we're paying the taxes? Or, no, no, no. Or how does it work? No, like no, tax no, benefits? Their name's on the deed, their name's on the title. Yeah. Yeah. Because you said they're still liable for the mortgage. Right. Yeah, we still get the depreciation for sure. Yeah. The, the, the property is in our name. So the property being in our name is what gives us the depreciation. Right. So I have a question now as a realtor. Instead of assuming the loan because you're not taking over the security fee, you're it's having them give you the property, but the mortgage company has the most mm -hmm. How does, explain the difference in assuming it and subject to Do you want to take this? Because assuming means you take the full yeah. Right. Exactly. So assuming the loan, you still have to go to lenders. Lenders are still involved. Yeah. Right. When it comes to subject two, the lender is not involved at all. It has to do with you and the seller. So that's the difference between assuming but it. Is it the buyer or the seller? Not the seller mm -hmm. in default if they're letting their longer. Up. So the main. Sorry, I'm just asking you yeah. 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 Good question. I've been doing for years. Yeah. I'm trying to wrap my head around. Something. Yeah. Yeah. So the main thing is. You want to constantly pay the mortgage. You never ever want to miss a payment. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. As long as you're making exactly. the payments, like we haven't had, a, I haven't had a situation because my seller contacted his mortgage company and they didn't say anything about him yeah. selling it to us. Subject yeah. to Some, yeah. yeah, those banks don't care. They yeah. want it, right? They yeah. want to get paid. But if you miss out, then obviously there's going to be an issue. They're going to foreclose. Yeah. That's right. Then you cause that issue to come Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. One more question. Yeah. Let's go. You're doing the assignment, what you talked about earlier, and you have Whole a seven. property under contract, but you can't find the buyer. What happens then? So before you contract the property, you should know that you're going to find a buyer, right? So there's a formula that most people use, and most buyers use as well. 75%. 75% minus repairs. So if you look at your ARV and your ARV is for round number is $100,000, automatically you have to be at 75,000 minus the repairs that it's needed. And then you have to subtract your assignment fee. So that's the number that you need to get the seller at for you to be able to make a fee. Typically, so like for example, like we typically like being below and a lot of flippers like to be below 75% because yeah. we understand like you know, things Stuff go happened. up, things happen. Yeah. Like we had, I had a rehab budget double on me and I'm lucky I got it at a deep enough discount. Otherwise I wouldn't be making any money. Yeah. So it's definitely important to know who your buyer is going to be before like your buyer avatar, but there's people in other markets who are buying at 90%. Yeah. So if you have that buyer in your back pocket, it's all, it's all good. Yeah. Realtors here. No, we buy anything 70% minus repairs. Yep. 70% um, anywhere. Yeah. We, we don't care. So, and, and obviously like risk profile of the deal too. So no one's not, not many people are going to be interested on being in, at 75% if it's one of these like older historic homes where it needs possibly 80K, which means like 120, possibly if the house goes down. So it's definitely just important to understand, use like a little bit of judgment to know the risk of the deal, who your buy avatar is going to be. And then it's an easy assignment, especially for us because yeah. we buy, we buy what? We've closed in three, five days, yeah. just waiting for title work. And a lot of buyers can do that. Yeah. So we're going to get into the power of networking a little bit more. So Aiden, actually, raise your hand, Aiden. He, Aiden, how old are you? How old, how old? You were 17 when you did your first deal? He was 16. He was 16 when he did his first real estate Everybody deal. Everybody give it up for Aiden. <laughs> All right. I will 
don't spoil it anymore. Take it away. So Aiden decided to make a post in a Facebook group and said, hey, I'm 16. I don't really know anything about real estate, but I'm willing to work hard. I'm willing to learn. Yep. So I reached out to him and I was like, hey, I was just like you, right? So I saw myself in him. So I said, hey, let's meet up. I want to see what kind of kid this person is. And let me see if I can get you your first deal. So every day, just like I was doing, Aiden was cold calling, cold calling. Cold call. He hated it. He called me after three months. He said, yo, Sal, I hate cold call. I said, I know everybody does, right? <laughs> and so after a few months, I was like, you know what? Let's go out there. Let's, let's start door knocking. So we decided to door knock pre-foreclosures. So people who are about to get their house foreclosed on, so they really need help, right? So we decided to go ahead and pull a list. We started door knocking on these pre-foreclosures. And within, what was it, his second or third door? He was able to get the seller under contract and receive $10,000 because I bought the deal from him in less than two or three weeks. So Aiden's one of the wholesalers y'all should reach out to. Right? I mean, you know, Aiden, he's going to sell me everything. But, but yeah, Aiden, you know, you should reach out to him because he gets a bunch of deals as well. So Yeah. And then in addition, like when it comes to the power of networking, kind of like I mentioned briefly before, it's like my thing is I'm pretty decent at raising private capital. So I've raised millions of dollars. Like I've been raising millions of dollars a month because we bought, what, eight or nine properties last month? Yep. How many this month? Seven. Seven this month. Yep. So we've just been buying and buying and buying, obviously, at the criteria we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And where's the money going to come from? I think, like, one thing that people are super skeptical skeptical of yeah. is, like, where are you guys getting all this money from? Is anyone else? Did someone else think that? Yeah. I know people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like, no, we don't have rich parents. We no. don't have trust funds. <laughs> babies or anything like that what we do is we go this is an example we go in rooms like this and we talk to people Austin I, I picked you up I, I, I hit anyone up and I, it's not like a salesy thing yeah. but I build relationships with people and then I present an opportunity so that networking is very important because when you have a let's say a property what let's do an example what deal did we do recently we got one we bought a house today yeah yeah, yeah. Today. so like we, I was in, I, I met people on Facebook groups. My yeah. first investor, my first person, I guess, to kind of believe in the vision when I was 19 years old was a person in the Facebook group. I just communicated with them, talked to them about real estate. And then eventually when I had an opportunity, I, got, I was like, hey man, like there's these cabins in the Great Smoky Mountain. Uh, people are killing it out there, making you know fifty grand or fifty grand a year in cash flow. Like if you give me eighty grand, I promise we'll we'll ride off into the sunset and we'll make a whole bunch of money. That was how my pitch started, and it got more and more refined. But when I met this guy, right, I had already built a relationship because we were talking about real estate, and it goes back to my previous point of tell everyone that you're a real estate investor. Tell everyone what you're doing because you never know who around you could be another lead source, yeah. who around you could be another private lender, yeah. who around you could just be someone uh, who could mentor you yeah. into real estate investing. So with me, that, that's how I did my first one. Got the 80 grand I needed and uh, we bought the cabin. I'm actually selling it now uh, for 25% more. And um, it just, I think we're making like 100 something thousand on it. And so, and that I slowly was able to build that up. And one thing I also want to go into is like, when you're a new investor, because I know there's a lot of you in here, I believe truthfully that your first couple of deals are, are learning experiences. They, they, they don't matter, but they mean everything. Because yeah. they're what's building the track record, proof right? The proof of concept for you to have the confidence to walk and talk like a real estate investor, yeah. but also to have the track record to be able to raise private capital from different people. So now it's never a question of my credibility, whereas when I was 19 years old, it was just like, man, you <laughs> come back to me when you've made some money, you know? Right. So just basically, just to go, to kind of summarize, is just make sure that you're just going out, telling everybody what you're doing, and just if you talk to enough people, you'll be shocked. And then when you go with private money lenders, the great thing is if you do good by them, you get repeat business and referrals. So that's kind of like, I've, I've got like three referrals on my last three raises. So, and I've never had a challenge. I always know where the money's coming from. Sometimes Marcel, Marcel really has hired an assistant. Cause he'll, 
<laughs> he'll call me. He'll tell me, like, hey, man, we have a deal closing in, like, two days. Have you raised the money yet? And I'll be like, no, I'm busy. And then, <laughs> and then he'll be like, well, we need to close. We close in two days. And I'll literally whip up my phone. I'll dial, like, one, two, three, four, five people that I've met before in rooms like this. Because I've literally, I, I think... Uh, some, he's not here today, but I've raised like a million dollars from this guy this year. Yeah. And um, yeah, like I, I get the money that I need to fund the deal and we get rock and rolling. Yeah. And then I, I tell him that I'm the best person in the world. Yep. I'm the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> so he's raised a half a million dollars two days before we close the deal. I'm like... Dude, Five, 537. 537 to be exact. So I call him, I'm like, hey, do we have that money for that deal? Bro? We're, we're closing two. in two days. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> Calls me back in 30 minutes, just raise it. I'm I, like, I have the money for our deal, so don't, don't look at me scared. <laughs> 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 I promise. <laughs> so, so yeah, the, the reality is you guys just got to start ne networking. Find people who you guys want to do deals with. The reality is if you find five people in here, these are the people who you can do deals with for the rest of the year, right? So... Go out, introduce yourself to people, let them know what you do, let them know how you can add value to them, and people will, re will reciprocate. You, right there, question? Can you talk about how you structure some of these private money deals? Yeah, yeah. yeah, originally, right? That's why I was saying, you're, thank you so much. Your first 10 real estate deals don't mean anything, but they mean everything. My first couple of raises, I was giving away 50% of the profits. So, like, I mean, the ex People, when, once you gain a lot more experience, you don't have to do that anymore. But that was what I had to do. I, I mean, I don't ever like to say had definitively, but that's what I felt like I had to do to basically get someone to take the risk of investing with me. Because why not invest with, you know, Kevin over here or, or Julie or Marcel now, you know? So at the very beginning, I was saying, hey, um, you know, you put in this money. Um, we take the risk together. I'm halfway liable for the risk with you. I'll do all the work, right? Let me quarterback this thing, and you will get 50%. I would never do that today. So just if anyone's thinking about it, don't ask me. But that's what I did at the beginning. I did that like four four times, um, and I still control some of these assets today. And now uh, the way that I do it is pretty much we're buying at 70% minus repairs. So when we're able to do that, investors are just more confident in the deal and then when you have that because i had that track record right of being the person who's never lost money who's never lost anyone else's money um and sorry to add to it when you're raising money like you have to give it back right yeah. so <laughs> like the, the most <laughs> yeah the most important thing when you're raising money right is you have a fiduciary responsibility to that investor so the most important thing should be protecting that investor's principle and also giving them their promised returns that's like a hundred percent like i would lose money i would not be a millionaire anymore sell off all my real estate to make sure that all my investors get paid so that's like primarily i'll answer your question in a sec and so um basically now because the deals are more strong i'm buying 70 percent my repairs we're offering them 10 to 12 percent interest um if it's a really tough raise we might offer a point and um, yeah, we get a promissory note, a uh, mortgage security deed. I sign a personal guarantee because I'm very calm, because I want the per investor to know, like, if this goes sour, I'm coming out of pocket. Yeah. If I lose 100 grand, I'm taking 100 grand out of my bank account okay. to pay my investor yeah. their principal plus their return. Yeah. So um, that's pretty much how I structure it today. You had a question, sir? Yeah, um, back to the, um, to the sub two. Yes, sir. Um, so basically, so on your exit strategy with a sub two, so when you get the seller to you take over their mortgage, mm -hmm. basically you're like, what is your exit strategy with that? So when you explain that to them, are you basically in your mind like got you. the loan throughout the whole process? Or are you thinking about getting out of the sub seller? Because it's basically on their credit, right? Yeah. Wow, so they basically can't do nothing. If they want to buy another house, it's on their credit, right? Yeah, so they can actually buy another home. So actually uh, I just, I was just, I actually helped that same seller said he didn't want to buy another house ever because he had such a bad experience. And then like six or seven months later, he was like, man, I want to buy another house. And they're yeah. telling me I have this thing on my current report. So basically what ended up happening is we spoke to the banks that we were talking to. We showed them the documents that are showing that I'm the one who's making the payment. Yes. And sorry. And you assume. Yeah. No, I didn't. No, I did not assume it. No. I did not assume it. And I'm the one, I'm the one making the payment. Right. 
and then I'm also the one who's going to be liable for this debt. And they were able to basically underwrite to where not all of the mortgage affected his debt to income ratio, and he was able to qualify for another home. So that's how, because a lot of in lenders actually, I don't, I love you, my lenders in this room, but you guys say a lot of things that are definitive that if you read the actual guidelines are not definitive. Yeah. So, and it happens all the time. It, it makes me upset. Um, so pretty much with that, I believe the language in there is the seller has to not be liable or it's like the language in there basically makes it so that subject twos you can still exclude the debt from the DTI. I can't remember exactly what it says. I can get back to you with it, but that's the actual answer. A lot of lenders will tell you the opposite because a lot of lenders uh, interpret things differently. But what a what it actually says allows for it, and we have like the real life example with um, with this seller that I had. Um, that answer your question? Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I have. Um. I'm paying. I paid. Uh, I took over his loan at like two hundred thousand, but I paid two hundred eighty thousand. Yeah, so it's so, a hybrid. Yeah, it's a hybrid. So in ten years, I have a balloon payment. For two hundred eighty thousand, so I have to take either eighty grand I'll make um, and give it to them. I have to refinance the property and give it to. Them. I'll, pro I'll probably sell it before then if the return on equity and return on. Oh God, I hate doing that. Return on equity just meaning basically the cash flow against what the mortgage or what the equity that's in the deal. If that return is dwindling and getting lower. I'll probably sell the asset before the 10 years to pay him back. You refinance. I could refinance him right now. Do I want to? No, because yeah. interest rates are crazy. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. That's what's in it for him. Um, so he gets that 80 grand in 10 years, and that's what he felt was fair. So. Kind of a technical question. Boom. Oh, are you paying your interest only, or are you paying principal? I don't pay anything, it's a balloon. So I only pay the mortgage, and then in 10 years, I pay the principal wow. of that. Yeah. So I, it's, just, it's just a straight 80. There's no interest. It's 0% interest. Okay. So kind of off that deal, you, you kind of have a question I was wondering anyways. Have you had any deals where you assume the mortgage and you had to pay them a chunk of cash or got like a second position to pay them for a certain amount of appreciation they got? Yeah. So haven't you done that? What do you, what do you, He's asking what basically you if we actually assumed it or like, you know, in a seller finance situation, sometimes they want like a, a down, down payment. payment. Yeah. So I bought a property over on East 31st, right? And we gave the seller $20,000 down, right? And I was actually able to negotiate no payments for a whole year, right? But the balloon was due after that year. So instead of like a five-year balloon, 10-year balloon, like he has, it was a one-year balloon. So payments deferred for a year. We pay him $20,000, including the closing costs, right? And then paid him in a year. Yeah. So it's basically like a long flip. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. fix and flip property. That's why I decided to do a one-year balloon instead of a five or a 10. Never and do that. Just, you want yeah. Flip. And the reason why, so like, just for the newer investors in the room, a balloon means you owe that entire chunk, yes. right, at once, right? Yep. So with when it comes to balloons, the closer the balloon, the higher your risk profile on that individual asset, right? The longer the balloon, the, the less risky typically, right? There's circumstances for the terms of that balloon, but that it typically, the longer you kick that can down, the less risky it will be um, over time. So sellers, obviously, it's more beneficial from a return standpoint to have a shorter balloon, but as investors, it's more beneficial from a return standpoint to get a longer one. But as we all, as a lot of us know in this room, not real estate's luckily not just like a logical business. Yeah. It's also, in the, people make emotional de decisions and then try to use logic. To back them up. Exactly. So yeah. um, that's pretty much like, an example of like just, we, we don't assume them. And the reason why is because the cash on cash return just sucks. I might as well just, you know, put 10% down on a second home or even sometimes 20% down. So, but it could make sense if you find the right opportunity. All depends on the deal. Yep. Any questions? 
What's your favorite deal? Ooh. Uh, ooh. Oh, the quad. Nah, man, I don't want to talk about the quad. <laughs> um, they're they're going to think I'm a thief. <laughs> <laughs> I bought a property. I might, no, nah, my favorite deal has to be um, the hotel. So I bought a property. I did, This was like earlier this year. Man, you should have bought it, dude. I signed it to you, but... Um, uh, I bought a property for like four for like three hundred three hundred or four two hundred. Yeah, yeah. It was three hundred thousand. Let's say it was three hundred thousand, mm -hmm. and I touched. I didn't even touch. It. Mm -hmm. I didn't even touch it, and I sold it for like a hundred and fifty thousand dollars more in a week. So that that's my favorite one because I it was like no stress, very little effort, just like here's one hundred fifty grand, yeah. go crazy. So we call that a wholesale, right? It wasn't because I didn't put it on the market though, yeah. so it's technically like a double close situation. Yeah, it's like a double close yeah. situation. Yeah, depends yeah. on who you're asking. Yeah. So he got the deal from a wholesaler, right? And then closed on the property, and then sold it immediately for a hundred and fifty thousand dollar profit. Didn't do any work to it in less than a week. Beautiful deal. You have a question, sir? Yeah. You guys say you got a lot of properties going on right now. How hands on are you going to? Yeah, completely chill, chill. <laughs> <laughs> not completely hands off. Yeah. Like we visit the sites and things ourselves, yeah. and then we also have we people that work. we trust. Who so when it comes to the construction side, me and him, we both realize. I mean, look at us. We're pretty. We're pretty men, right? So we don't get our hands dirty. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> we're not the type of people who are going there swinging hammers and everything. Yeah. So pretty much. Like, my thing is always contractors that we really like their work. They yeah. did it on time. And sometimes they came under budget. Yeah. I mean, like, when does that ever yeah. happen? Yeah. yeah. And so we found contractors. Under we built good relationships with them. And we felt so confident in their work and their abilities and their integrity. Um, just saying, if you can find all those things, treat them like gold. And um, basically, we trust in them to kind of give us the, the right numbers, guide us on what projects we should take on, what we shouldn't, how much it's going to be, and um, yeah, we go to the sites, we look at it, act like we know what we're looking at, and then we have people as well, like our realtor, Chelsea Phillips, who will go to the property, and she'll let us know, like, hey, this looks like crap, she, she'll call the property, and be like, this looks like ass, or she'll be like, wow, this is okay, and that means you're going to get over ask. so um, yeah, that's pretty much how we roll. We leverage other people. Like a lot of like the name of the game with business, we've like discovered is like leverage. So like we trust in the experiences of people who've done it way more than us. We pay them as much as they want, and then we just back that out in our numbers. So yeah. that's pretty much kind of like our business strategy. And then we learn too, right? So when we're going to the construction sites, we're asking questions, but we're very, like it's we're not losing money. We're making we're making money on our deals. So it's, uh, it's been a beneficial experience just trusting in the professionals. Mm -hmm. um, if you had to start over from scratch, like what would be your, uh, like where would you start at? So we have differing opinions. Yeah. Let's, let me hear yours. So if I had to- Oh, his question was, if we had to start over from scratch, yeah. right? What will we do to start? What, what, what will be your approach? Yeah, how will we approach it? How will we do it? So go so ahead. So if I had to start over, my approach would be, I would do similar to what I've done, but what I would have done was I would have spent less money, more time figuring out how to find deals. I would have also spent more time figuring out how to raise capital. Because after you have the deal, right, now all you need is the money. But the hardest part is finding the deal. So that's the main thing I would have done. I would have decided, okay, acquisitions is the first thing that I'm gonna specialize in, which is finding the deal. I'm gonna figure out a sales process. I'm gonna dial that sales process in. I'm gonna learn about sales. I'm gonna learn about human beings, human nature, people, how they're wired. And then I'm gonna learn how to raise the capital. Once I learn how to raise the capital, now I can put two and two together and just build that portfolio. Do you use your money for renovations if they're needed or do you use other people's money? We use our money. Uh, we use our money for renovations if we need to. Yeah, if it goes over. Exactly. If it goes over, we'll use our own money. And then if we want to keep it, like since we turn everything yeah. into short-term rentals, we're just leaving like fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, if it's a you know multi-unit into right. the property. So it just depends on the the property. Yeah. Yeah. But if we're leaving that much of the deal, it's a really it's good a really deal. <laughs> yeah. 
on the well, we have to, right? Like yeah. a, the contractor says that they don't have enough money. Right. I don't. An extra ten thousand dollars. I'm not going to go to my investors and ask right. them for that. I'm just going to cover it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, for me, the way I would have done it is a little bit similar to you. I would have like kind of, I would have folk. How I did is I like fire hosed real estate education. Yeah. I, I like at one point when Bigger Pockets was on episodes. Who knows Bigger Pockets? Who's a, come on, like Bigger Pocket fans, let's go, man. Yeah. So I'm actually speaking at BPCon this year in October. So if anyone wants to come join me there and see me speak again. Um, I'd love to have you in a Did y'all hear that? He's speaking at BPCon. Give it up for your boss. But I appreciate that, brother. But um, I would just do that again. I would focus 100%. I listened at 650. I listened to every episode. So each episode is an hour, hour, hour and a half. I listened to all their rookie podcasts. All I did a lot of their YouTube content. I read, like, I was reading, like, a book every two weeks. And I would just focus on being knowledgeable that, that like just obsess, like have like a genuine obsession over like basic real estate fundamentals. And then I would start with doing my first deal, um, probably in my situation would have still been a house hack, or maybe if I would have met a Marcel, I it would have been a fix and flip. And then once I did that deal, once I had confidence, proof of concept, I would then go to everybody in the world, everyone in the planet, and tell them how I did my first real estate deal. Yeah. Keep telling people, keep telling people, keep telling people, build relationship, act like that deal. I just won the Grammys, you know? <laughs> and I would walk around and I'd build relationships with as many people as possible, try and add value, connect people as I'm meeting people. And eventually, then I have a network in my back pocket. Now I have that private capital. And I just now look for Marcel. I'm a, I'm a lazy guy, right? So then I find the Marcel. And then I get, find Marcel, I say, hey man, you want to come to Savannah? And then I hop on his back, <laughs> and, then I, and then, you know, then we mesh together. Now I have the network, I have the money, he has the, uh, the deals, and we make millions of dollars together. Yep. All right, so what's next? You're talking about our task that you guys have accomplished, what's the five-year plan? Damn. Sick. Go ahead. I don't have five-year plans, yeah. bro. Tell, tell, tell. <laughs> The conservative one or like the conservative one. Alright. So <laughs> Don't be Yeah, go ahead. All right, all right. So this year, me and Marcel were very confident we'll do at least like two and a half to three, five million dollars in profits from our real estate business. So the goal for next year is to do ten million dollars. So right now we're building out our team, we're trying to scale, uh, keep our pace of buying uh, multiple properties every single month and then um, yeah, that business-wise, that's where we're going. And then me and him are big on, we don't like flipping and selling and stuff. I hate selling assets. Yeah, we want to take all this everything. money and then put it into something massive, like, I don't know, the city market or something. <laughs> <laughs> or something. So that, that's pretty much where we're heading for the ne as far as next year goes. And then, you know, take, me, we both want to retire our parents and, yeah. uh, in the next 12 months. What else? What do you got? Yeah. yeah, making 10 million next year, retiring our parents, what else we got? Um, in the next few years, our goal is to leave, right, and be able to systemize our business and be able to travel as much as we can as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right, what you think about getting into commercial estate? Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. yeah, well, we talk about how great we are. Let's talk about a mistake that we made earlier this year. Yeah. Tears. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right, so this is the biggest backdrop I ever had, ever in my life. And, and we didn't lose money, no, just to no, clarify. No, no, we, we, just, we just missed out on opportunity for being sued. So we had a deal under contract, a 72-unit apartment complex under contract. You may have seen this deal in the news. You might have seen it. For $5.5 million, right, here in Savannah, for $5.5 million. At the time, we, we weren't thinking clearly. Right? Well, we, we weren't thinking clearly. We didn't decide to figure out how to get the money and go ahead and close on that property ourselves. Keep in mind, the property appraised for $7.2 million. We had an appraisal in hand for $7.2 million. As is. So we would have been walking into $1.5 million instantly. Right? And so we decided to bring on our friends who are multifamily investors as well. And we said, all right. Why don't you guys try to buy this property? So we brought a few of our friends and they went through their due diligence 
And they ended up deciding, basically at the one yard line, that they were no longer interested. But the reason why they were no longer interested is because the property manager, who was also a listing agent, had came and said, hey, you guys are selling this property. I get to get a 3% fee as well on top. Yeah, just muddied up the deal, man. Yeah, muddied up the deal, and, and the investors just didn't like it. They were like, too many hands in the pot, we're out. This deal sold two months later. Wait, 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 wait. Let, let's back up. Let's back so up. keep in mind, right? Yeah. Like, I told you guys I raise money all the time. Like, this yes. would have been a very easy call easy for raise. me to make. Easy I could have just called. I have, like, two people that I could have just brought in on this thing, and we would probably got 50% of this. And... Um, just like logically, I just am disappointed in just not being forward thinking, but this is part of the game, right? Yeah. You win some, you lose some. Right. So five and a half million dollars we had in a contract for, tell them what happened. So two months later, the property is posted on the market and it sells for $8.75 million. So that's a $3 million loss in, in our hands. Yeah. Like, I can't sleep. <laughs> I think about this every single day. Because all I had right. to do was call a buddy, right? right, buy the property, and list it on the market. They didn't even list it on, like, LoopNet. They, they listed it on Zillow, right? If you know anything about multifamily, like, you're not supposed to list something uh, like that on, on Zillow. You list it on LoopNet or Crexy or... Yeah. And obviously, we have other challenges, right. too, with, like, you know, hiring and firing people, mm -hmm. you know... Everyone has deal problems at some point, and then the well goes crazy. Um, just met, deal goes over budget, crazy tenants, the whole nine yards. Yeah. But we all, I think, like the biggest thing with being an investor, being a business, is just you never give up. No. At the end of the day, like it is all on you. A lot of us come from the W two world, where a little bit of that liability is all on the entrepreneur. But in this business. You just have to keep pushing and be a problem solver. And that's what I truly believe my superpower is, is I, I call myself a world-class problem solver because I will figure it out. It's just, I haven't yet maybe, but I will ask the questions, I'll do what it takes, and I'll figure out what needs to be figure outable to make, make it happen. And to be able to hit your goals, that's exactly how you have to think. You have to understand that no matter what the problem is, you're going to figure it out. Uh, what, if anything, was surprising once you guys started to hit your stride and see success? Was anything different than you expected? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, how, I, I want to say, yeah, quick, like, because I remember it was like, I was buying a house, you know, every three six, months. yeah, every couple of months, yeah, three, and then months. now it feels like we, we literally buy a house every week. Every week. Like last week, we bought two houses yeah. every single week. Yeah, we got two under contract today. Yeah, two, two. See, two <laughs> so like <laughs> two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like, um, just like how like it kind of like fire hoses, but like you know, it's on us to figure out how to build ourselves into entrepreneurs that can handle it, yeah. and then also just your challenges are different. So before, right, it was like, I need to find a deal. I couldn't find a deal. Now it's like, God damn, I have to find the money for the deal. And then it's like, God damn, I have to manage all the people surrounding the deal. And so um, I would say those are like the biggest surprises. But you're, you're going to be able to handle it. Once you get there, you're not there for no reason. These things don't just stumble across your table. It's the result of preparation for the months, years, decades that you put in. And as long as you have a long enough time horizon for when you plan on reaching success and hitting your goals and you're willing to stick through the sucky periods, you will you will get there. I truly believe in that. Yeah. What, what kind of haters have y'all had to deal with? <laughs> if you don't have haters, you're like, Pumpkin, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, obviously, because we're both 21 years old, we have a bunch of people who... They, they hate to see the success, right? They're, they they're hate us because they ain't us. Right? They're, they're, they're going to try to shit on it, right? They're going to be like, oh, they're 21 years old. They must be doing something wrong. They must be doing something incorrectly. They're moving too fast. Everybody wants to put their limiting beliefs onto you. But the reality is we don't have to receive those limiting beliefs. We don't have to take them in. Everybody's gonna, people might say, oh, you guys should buy one house per year because that's the way that they did it. Yeah. But the reality is you're your own person. And we're our own people, so we decide to move the way that we want to move. So the haters that we've had has never really affected us. It doesn't really bother us in any way, shape, or form. Um, and <laughs> when you're real, it doesn't matter. So like for us, we can stand behind everything we do because we're doing it. Yeah. Most people like who maybe aren't doing the things that they say they're doing, 
they have things to worry about. But for us, like, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's as real as the money in my bank account or right. the real as the properties that I have my name on. Right. Yes, sir. So y'all got all y'all business in um, all y'all properties in the LLCs, right? Yes, sir. So y'all, so y'all got each property in the LLC in different LLCs. Go ahead, answer. Because that. I read a book. And it's like you got the yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Continue. Okay, I read a book. It was like you keep all your properties holding in companies LLCs, and all that kind of stuff. Because say you get sued, somebody can sue yes. all your properties. So like, I was asking, do y'all got all of them in different LLCs? Hey, so I'm gonna be real with you. Like, we're not like. Perfect, right? Yeah. So we kept it simple, stupid. We have like our oper we have like our LLCs that we use to buy properties, and then we have our holding companies yeah. um, individually, depending on the asset, depending on who's on the deal, right? Because I told you guys, like, I, I told, I mentioned I used to partner. Um, <clears throat> so we'll have our LLC we we'll used to buy it, and then we have the holding company behind that LLC, and that's how we structure it because that's how our legal team taught us. Yeah. There's probably better there's ways. Better ways there's do. worse yeah. ways. Like we just kind of. Focus on what we're good at, and then we pay people to help us figure it out. And I'm sorry, that, that part wasn't helping, but that's what we do. Yeah. And treat your team like gold, because it's important. Your, your accountant, your attorneys, all that kind of stuff. What, did someone, did you have a question? Oh, no? Oh, I got a question. Yeah. Uh, what took you guys the longest to learn? Acquisitions. Yeah, I would say acquisitions. Marketing. Yeah, acquisitions, marketing. So I would say the whole sales cycle, right? Because a lot of people, like, you can find deals, but when it comes to acquisitions, it just takes time. You just have to talk to hundreds and thousands of sellers. And you really can't do that by just listening to a podcast. You actually have to go out and do it. Um, so I would say the acquisitions process and marketing is what has taken us the longest to learn. And then, like... We're still Gen Z, so like everything's like now, 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 now. Yeah, but like it's not like that. Like I have relationships that I made two years, years ago, ago when I started walking into in these type of rooms that are just I'm just now leveraging and creating opportunities from today. Yeah. So that's another thing that we've had to learn is like just patience. And um, but one thing I really appreciate is like a lot of people in this room have been like a wealth of knowledge. Yeah. Like I think me and Marcel, we can both confidently say the only thing that we know is that we know very little so we really do like take not out we do really try to learn as much as we can from different people because my dad he taught me he teaches me this all the time it's just like you can learn something from everybody everyone has a piece of information that could be applicable in your life so that's just kind of like the that's kind of like what we've been learning so when you're talking about marketing you mean like your deals or your rental properties or yourself as a business owner. everything right when it comes to marketing ourselves right personal brand right my videographer Rashawn is right over here um, also when it comes to the business itself right when it comes to let's say the mailers that we're sending Jesus. or <laughs> the PPC that we do the Google SEO the ads that we're running all of those different things it's it takes a lot of split testing kind of just like the the sales process you have to learn by doing it yeah. Over and over and over and over again. You can't just listen to a podcast and say, I'm going to use that ad and it's going to work in your market. You're going to have to constantly tweak and tweak. And yeah, tweak. We, we try we try to do as much as we can afford to do. So everything gets reinvested back in the build, into the business. That's why you don't see me walking in with like a gold chain and um, I don't know. A like rolling. A, a rolling and a Lamborghini because <laughs> we spend all our money back into the into business. The business. Yeah. But we do a lot of, um, we do a lot of testing pretty much with marketing, like direct mail. Um, geez, it's, a, it's expensive. Um, yeah. And we it's just real fast. give it the, we give it, what, what do you call it? The cycle? What do the you call sales it? sales conversion cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Because every different type of marketing source has a different type of sales conversion cycle. Like, let's say with direct mail, if you don't have about a year's worth of direct mail money, don't even start. Don't even start. And the reason why is because it takes about a year for the sales conversion cycle to really start hitting for you to start getting consistent deal flow. Yeah. And then like with cold call, <laughs> cold calling, man, it's like, Forever. You, he's, you know, he's cold calling and like, he's great, right? Yeah. He's, he's able to have these sales skills that he's been learning and things like that. But now we're hiring cold callers 
and now we have to go through the process of training them. And then, you know, if you miss a bunch of months when you're not training them properly, you can't really apply those months to your sales conversion right. cycle. So now you're spending even more yeah. money on even more people, even more yeah. BAs, and you yeah. have to spend the time yes. to train them, then to assess whether they're good or not. Yep. And you know, some of them aren't good. Yeah. Some, of them <laughs> some, of them, are. some of them are, but then you, you still have to give them the opportunities and things like that and see how you as a as a leader, as a business exactly. owner, can improve upon that process. Because yeah. a lot of times it's not your team, it's you. Yeah, right? most you of know. the time. Yeah. What else we got? Share your, your turnover on deals presented to deals completed on purchases. So mm -hmm. people understand that it's not... Ah, uh, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. do 20 to get one, you do yeah. 17 to do one, you yeah. do 14 to do one. It's a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a lot. So, a hundred percent. So a lot of people, they put in one offer and they're like, man, I didn't get the deal. I'm putting in four to five offers a day. <laughs> a day. Every single day. It's not a lot. <laughs> and most of my offers don't get accepted, right? So that's 20 to 25 offers a week and it takes us you know, 20 to 25 officers to pick up a deal. Sometimes we get lucky and- I had a good week, man. Yeah. I had like, I had one week when I, I got like five in a row or something right. crazy. Right, exactly. And I'm you, lucky. you will have those weeks, right? But in business as a whole, you wanna yeah. make sure that you're tracking and you wanna make sure that you figure out what the exact process is, right? Okay, 25 to one, for example, just like Kevin mentioned. And sometimes we'll have days where it's, one of one, right? We we'll, we'll make one offer that day, and we'll get that offer accepted. Well, most of the time, it's like it's literally twenty-five to yeah. one, yeah. like literally, like yeah. you can count on it. Also, explain how your practice and perfecting your presentations help your turnover ratio. hundred percent. And if you don't understand the acquisition sales process, and you're just throwing spaghetti at the wall, right? Because a lot of the time, people will call a seller, and the seller will say, "Oh, I want this for the property." You run your numbers, and you say, "It's a hundred thousand dollars. That's what I can pay for it." And you call the seller and you're like, $100,000. The, the seller's gonna tell you, hey, no way, or F off. Because they don't right? care about your number. They don't care about your number. The reality is you have to be able to dive deep into their motivation. You have to be able to figure out really what the problem is in that seller's life and be able to paint that picture for them, for them to understand that, hey, this is gonna be me taking away this problem that you're currently going through, providing you with that solution and giving you cash in your pocket as well. Because if they don't have a problem, then we can't provide them a solution a lot of the time. And if that's the case, usually you're gonna end up overpaying for the deal. Yeah, and the worst, and like real estate 101, most important thing is you make your money on the buy, on the buy. right? So what you're paying for that property, right? Your terms on that property is the most important aspect. Because if you overpay, now real estate's very forgiving, right? Real estate can be very forgiving in the sense that over time, mm -hmm. you'll look like the smartest person in the world. Right. But at the very beginning, you just want to crunch your numbers, right? And understand what, how deep of a discount you can get and have like a set criteria that encompasses all of those risks that you're taking. Because you are taking risks when you're using debt. That's one thing. We can talk about numbers, cash on cash return, return on investment, all these different things. Oh, but at the end of the day, you're taking a risk and there's not, I don't know any mathematical equation that's accounting for that. So you need to be able to assess those risks whenever you're analyzing a property that you want to purchase. In the beginning when you were acquiring a couple of properties to now when you have multiple properties, like are you taking equity out in the beginning so you could fatten up your pockets a little bit and then holding some more now. I, yeah. yeah, so for us, it definitely changed, right? Because like I mentioned at the beginning, I started off wholesaling. Now, nine times out of 10, we're not wholesaling. We're, right? we're going to buy it, right? And so that's a way that our exit strategy has changed. A lot of the time, I used to wholesale before. It's all sold to me. <laughs> and, and now I'm analyzing the deal. I'm like, can I keep this, right? Should I flip this? What should I do with this, right? I'm not really wholesaling it. Um, right away, unless it makes the most sense for us to do. It's just one of our different exit strategies. I'm saying, as far as mm -hmm. now that you are boss, you're not, you're not so much a wholesaler, yeah. you're a boss. So, are you refining, getting, getting some equity out to build, to build your own capital? Or are you refining to keep, it, keep the equity in the house and get the ROI for the uh, Yeah, because today's interest rates are really, really high, right? So, right now, I'm not going to be refining anything for a while. 
Unless um, it but, makes sense. Unless it makes sense. But Jabbar has refied a few of his properties. Yeah, so like for me, I start off more on the buying side. So I was buying, buying, buying. And like really this year is when I started focusing on like, all right, man, these properties are getting expensive. So I need to make some more money. So like now we do a lot more flips. So I mean, we, buy, we don't buy in the hood to keep, but we buy in the hood to flip. And when we're doing that, we're able to kind of dispose of properties that we don't want get the cash, you know, stash away for the business operating expenses, but then put it to be to the rentals that we're more selective about. But that's kind of where we get to chunk most of our money is from like these flips. Uh, as far as refinancing goes, that's not really something that we're doing and let like for me I have to, I have to, right? But for our, for this specific property. So, unless like it makes sense, it's always a numbers decision on whether we're going to refinance, we're going to uh, flip it, or we're going to keep it and for the most part, we haven't found anything where a cash out refinance ha is like necessary. But we can. I mean, it's cool. It's cool to have it, but we're more so focused on having cash to supplement the business. That's the cash cow to uh, dump into more more assets. That's the business. What kind of business arrangement do you guys have? Sometimes you're saying my property, sometimes you're saying our property. Yeah, so he, Jabbar owns properties that he owns with partners. He has properties that he owns by himself. I have property that I own with partners, and I have properties that I own with him, and I have properties that I own by myself. Yeah, so it, it depends, right? Because I, I started buying one while he was wholesaling, so that's why it's, there's a difference. Um, and, but for the flipping, as far as like the flipping side goes, we're doing that together and we're also keeping together as well you, you know but he's you know sometimes he'll keep some without me i can't get butt hurt because i was doing it first <laughs> oh yep how does furnishing your airbnbs impact your cash flow oh you i great love question. this question great question Woo! all right so um airbnbs we love doing them First of all, like, just let me share the criteria with everyone. So everything, that's why I'm selling my cabin. The only asset in my portfolio that doesn't work as anything but a short-term rental is my cabin. And that's why I'm getting rid of it because I believe the risk profile on that deal is way too, too high. So for us, like, we have a designer that goes in there and she professionally designs our property to make them beautiful. And, um, yeah, the, I, I would say, like, and every property she touches, it seems like, it turns to gold. So when I'm running my numbers, I run my numbers for short-term rentals on a conservative or like what the average short-term rental is doing, even though I know that my designer, Mary, she's going to go in there and she's going to make it in that 75th, 90th percentile to where I'm always booked. So design, I would say is like vital. And then another thing, and I'll give you guys a name, you can compete with me, um, is you want to have also amenities in your short-term rentals that help you stand out because a lot of people are um, buying these properties and furnishing them in ways where it's not going to attract the uh, enough people, right? They're not doing, they're doing average listings and with how competitive the space is now, you can't be average. Average is now you're not going to hit your numbers, right? So you want to be great. So you have to just spend money on the design and really be very intentional about it. Um, look at your enemies. We call it, we do the enemy yeah, method, yeah. meaning that we're looking at all the competi comp competing properties in that area and we're, we're breaking down that listing. This one has a pool. Well, this one's doing 25% better than all the other listings that don't have a pool. This one has a fire pit or fire pits in the amenity that are increasing our average daily rate. Is that getting us more clicks? Do we have a strong amenity or a strong focus in this property that's going to get it clicked on to impact that Airbnb algorithm or that VRBO algorithm. So the design I'd say is like, is I can't even stress it enough. Like, and that's why we buy deals so deeply. And if we're leaving money into a deal, we don't buy a short-term rental and do it halfway haphazard. It's either all or nothing. So, um, I mean, my Instagram is Jabbar, J-A-B-B-A-R underscore invest star. Like just invest instead of investor, invest star. I, I think I posted a before and after of like kind of some of the work that I do. I'm going to continue to keep on doing that. But that's kind of like the play. It's like we just try and do our very best on the design at the beginning. We buy deep enough so we can afford to pay the designer and pay for all her furniture um, to do it right the right way. And so we can maximize profits on that exit strategy. Some of the money that you're making 
I guess I'm wondering if like your profits the first year, part of it has to go to pay down the furniture and the design, or you've already covered that because you bought it because of that? Um, varies on the deal. So we have deals where that is the case. Yeah. We're we look at cash on cash return. Right. So I'm not really like per se looking at it like I'm paying myself back. I'm just looking at if I invest $100,000 in the property and it's spending out $50,000 a year, that's a return that I'm good to live at and I'm just moving on to the next one. And that's another thing. Real estate gets fun like when you have a lot um real estate gets more fun when you have the budget, right, to do things the right way. Right way. When I was like scrappling like that $8,000 I put into my first cabin, that was like pretty much all my money, but and I and I couldn't do it the way that I should have. So um, we're buying it deep enough, but then we're also like, if we have a flip, right? We're paying, you know, capital gains taxes. That money is more beneficial in our property's back pocket rather than Uncle Sam's pocket. Speaking about Uncle Sam, how do you? Um, Jesus is not the risk. <laughs> Especially the new flips. Yeah. Um, and it's flips in it. Yeah, with them. That money and all that. Yeah, so right now, uh, one of the strategies that we use is we buy properties and we hold them, right? So we can depreciate. The and cost segregation. Exactly. Yeah. Through cost segregation. We're doing a bunch of them this year. Yeah. Both and then. So, but if you so if you're holding properties, you're still liable for the flips, correct? Or is there a... Still liable for the flips. So, so if you're making a huge profit on the flip, mm-hmm. you're appreciating the properties that you're holding. Does it wash or is it per property? It's, so you have to buy a certain amount of... We have to buy a certain amount of rental properties to be able to reduce our tax liability. Okay. So we just kind of... Like, we're not... Like, I haven't done my... I'm going to be real with you. I haven't done my 2022 taxes yet. I'm still working yeah. on... Yeah, okay. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, this game, the name, at least our strategy uh, from our tax planners, we're just going to buy a bunch, depreciate as much as we can, and um, be more proactive. Because this year also is when our business has really been scaling. So a lot of this money, unfortunately, we didn't plan for it all to kind of like just come in all at once for us to have been like, oh, well, we need to buy, you know, a X amount of real estate. Yeah. So th- this year we'll, we'll take the, the lesson whatever lesson we learn from the government next year, we're going to be very, 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 very right. serious when it comes to like yeah. our purchase to flip ratio. Yeah. So, uh, syndications that you can invest in. So that's enough, something that I'm looking in yeah. right now. Syndicators as well. Sorry? Sorry. They syndicate right now. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll talk to you guys in a sec. But there's a uh, syndication. So there's syndications where you can be a portion of an investor on a uh, per- uh, be a limited partner, LP. right? Yeah. LP and syndications where they offer some more tax benefits for you to be able to depreciate against. Mm-hmm. So that's something we're also exploring as well. Yeah, we haven't done it yet, but that's what we're looking at. Yeah, what else we got? Are you acquiring more properties? Do you negotiate better deals with your private investors? Like, yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Well, so for me, I I do negotiate. With my main guys that have like trusted me from the beginning, I'm a little bit less aggressive on that. So yeah, so because like two ten versus two percent interest is not really that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. But um, yeah, we're we're not paying points. So <laughs> like it, unless we absolutely have to, like we have we have, and like if we can't have a private investor because I got too lazy and I waited the day before, we have that person we know we can go to is going to just charge us a whole bunch of money for it, okay. his money. But um, yeah, pretty much like when you're raising money and the more experience you get, the better terms you typically get. And um, that's, I mean, I think Grant Cardone pays his investors like 4%. Yeah, 4%. I want to be like that guy, <laughs> you know? So yeah. 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 And it's just a conversation like anything else. It's just like, hey, and you, you know, you have more power when you have more options. Right. So if you have less options, you have less power. So it's just another thing to analyze. What we got? What we got? We're going to stare at each other? Yeah. All right. All right, guys. Well, we are so um, appreciative and so blessed that you guys sat here and came out to listen to us tonight. Me and Marcel, man, I thank you, brother. 
Um, and we, we hope that you guys gained a lot of value from your time here with us tonight. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you for coming, everyone. We really appreciate it. The two words I heard a lot from these are my friends right here, and y'all needed to come to dinner soon. They eat at my table anytime they want, and that's a big part of it is relationships and networking, and that's what we're here for, okay? You need relationships, and you need friends like this. And um, we do have a podcast all about our local Savannah investors. It's called Cashless Savannah Podcast. If anyone's curious, Suzanne is episode two. Aiden is episode six. Kevin and his wife are coming up, episode 13. So please tune into that. We are going to be doing a live podcast, aren't we, Javar? Yeah. <laughs> In the future with Chandler. Chandler's here somewhere. But thank you for coming. I want to challenge every one of you to keep educating yourselves. And someone in this room, you need to invite to lunch, dinner, a drink, breakfast, a waffle. I don't really care. But I challenge you to get out of your comfort zone and say, hey, so nice to meet you, John. Let's go to lunch. I'm probably going to profit from that relationship. This one heard me on a podcast yeah. years I cold, ago. I cold emailed or cold IG DM'd you. Yep. Instagram. Yeah. He reached out. He said, hey, you're in Savannah. I'm in Savannah. We went to have lunch, and my life has been better ever since. So I want to challenge you. And we didn't know each other. We just went no. to lunch and had a great time. So I want to challenge every single one of you. Don't you dare leave without making a date with someone in this room that you did not have a date with before tonight. So anyway, let's thank them again. These two are fabulous. Thank you guys.